Hi Robert, welcome to the Lisa podcast. On the podcast we talk about all things addiction. So if you wouldn't mind just kicking us off with a bit about um, how you sort of got to where you are today. Sure. Um, uh, when I went to university after I, uh, I was in the military, um, in, uh, in the, when the draft was in the 60s and went to Vietnam. And then when I came home, I uh, started going to school and uh, I got a degree in social work my first degree, and uh, to do that, I needed to get uh, practicums in different agencies, and one of them was an alcohol and drug agency, and I really liked working with them, and before I even finished up my bachelor's in social work, they offered me a position, um, so um, I started doing, um, learning how to do alcohol treatment um, uh, in, in, a, in a mental hospital that also put in, in those days, we, uh, we uh, basically put the alcohol abusers um, in the same place with the schizophrenics and other types of individuals that were having difficulties. And uh, um, my history is my father was a, um, a, a horrible drinker and uh, caused a lot of problems in the home. And my mother died at 45. And I think partly to the stress and the anxiety of uh, having to deal with my father. So it was a natural kind of thing for me to do is want to help people who have addiction problems. And what I did was I learned the, the community reinforcement approach, which had a couples counseling uh, involved in it. And I was doing couples counseling. And I saw that the spouse, the non-drinker, uh, still had some kind of influence over the individual who was drinking. Uh, and maybe he didn't want to stop at all. So what I, what I started to do then is try to figure out how I could get spouses in uh, earlier so we wouldn't have to wait until these guys got so severe with their substance abuse problem. Uh, they were physically unfit. I mean, they might have gotten car accidents or hurt somebody or even gotten killed um, because of their, their driving and, and being drunk and so on. So um, I started the program in the 1970s called the Concerned Persons Program and uh, did that for a year or so, just learning how to get uh, some of the craft stuff started. And CRAF stands for Community Reinforcement and Family Training. So it took pieces of the original CRA stuff that I did with Dr. Azrin, who was a student of B.F. Skinner. So I'm uh, really an opera conditioning guy. And I put that together with my social work skills. Um, and eventually we came up with the CRAF model. And uh, when I moved to New Mexico and met Bill Miller, who's become my friend the last 30 years now, we're still working together on different things. And uh, we got together and we wrote the first grant ever for CASA, which is the Center for Alcoholism, Substance Abuse, and Addictions at the University of New Mexico, where we both were uh, psychology professors. And uh, uh, we got the first CRA grant, and then we just went on to the next and the next, and finally we started doing craft programs. And, and now I've done crafts in uh, all six of the seven continents. I've done some in the UK, uh, all over the UK, uh, I've been to, to um, Canada, I've been to England, I've been to Wales, I've been to Scotland, and uh, I've been all of those places uh, teaching craft. And now there's actually in northern uh, uh, um, England, uh, there's a program called Positive uh, Practice Program uh, that's, that's out of around Manchester area, and I'm still in good contact with those people, and they're doing the craft model, which is developed to help get individuals into treatment and say, I'm never going to treatment, leave me alone. So that's what craft is all about. Get those guys in earlier. In America, we always thought you had to hit bottom before you got help. And my system kind of raises up the bottom. So let's get them in more quickly. Yeah. Okay. And I think the interesting approach that you have is it also brings in um, the person where uh, and their family, which is also a big like role. Um, obviously the family is also affected, but, along with the, the effect that it has, they're also like enabling in a lot of ways as well. Yeah, and one of the things that I, I was surprised, Luke, because one of the, the things that we found at, at the, after the studies, you know, the follow-ups we would do in research, of course, you have to do a lot of uh, follow-up to see whether things work or don't work, and that the people, women came in and they had anxiety problems, they had depression, anger problems, and they had physical problems, like, migraine headaches and GI distress and so on and so forth. And we measured all those things when at baseline and then all the way through 12 months. And what we found was on our studies is that 
the anxiety, the anger, the depression, and, and all of those things, including negative physical problems like headaches and so on, they were reduced dramatically by going through the craft program. And I think part of it is a lot of these women um, get picked on by other people. Why don't you get rid of this mom and how can you kick your kid out of the house? He's using drugs, blah, blah, blah. And, and so instead of having that kind of a situation, they're actually working with a the therapist who understands the trouble they've been through. And I think that these women got a lot of courage and a lot of stamina. And so most of the people who come into the program are female, not that men can't come in, but they just don't come in at the same rates. But um, anybody who comes in to help somebody else, I think, is uh, is a pretty cool individual. And we do everything we can in craft to support them, whatever they want to do and how they want to get them in treatment and when they want to get them in treatment and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering what your opinion would be. Like, I go to Al-Anon, and one of the things um, that is around Al-Anon is a lot of the time um, the relative or family of, an, of like a, an alcoholic or a substance user, they have a lot of stuff that they need to sort out and they have to go through their own journey. And what you just mentioned then is sometimes just a lot of women. How do you find the difference between the person blaming it on the substance user and the work they actually need to do as well? Yeah, that, that you know, um, I've gotten some flack in trainings. That why did you use Al-Anon? It, it's not meant to get people into treatment, and it's not. But uh, one of the, the person who wrote the manual for the 12-step protocol also worked on other things, and he's a, someone who believes in AA and will support it. But what we, we did was we chose people who were um, Al-Anon master-level therapists, and we actually used them. And the difference really is, is that Al-Anon teaches uh, detachment, loving detachment, taking care of yourself. And what Al-Anon did well was that they helped people reduce their anxiety and depression and so on. But they had very low luck, maybe 15, 17 percent in some of the studies of engaging someone into the treatment program. Well, the craft averages around 70 percent of the people that we talk to come into treatment. And I'm not trying to put down Al-Anon, but the thing about it is if you want to feel better, and take care of your own life, and to get somebody into treatment, Kraft does the extra piece. And it, it did help lower all those, you know, depression and anxiety stuff as much or or even more, a little more than al did, but it also got them to get uh, people into treatment at, at a very high rate. And even the people in Kraft who didn't get their loved one into treatment, they still lowered their anxiety and depression and felt much better about life. Um, I mean, that's a big key, you know. We try to work on uh, issues with the spouse originally or the, the non-user originally and help them get stronger uh, psychologically um, and work on depression and anxiety and, and let them know they're not crazy and they didn't cause the problem. Because a lot of women say, I must have been a bad mother or I must have been a horrible wife because why would you be doing this? Well, we have to help them get over that um, like they do in al But we go a little step further and teach them different ways to engage with their their husband or their, their children or whatever, in, in a sense. This one quick example. So let's say a man comes home and he's drunk, and the wife starts bickering with him and arguing with him and calling him names and cursing and throwing stuff, whatever. And I, I can understand how frustrated they get. But that doesn't help. So what we try to teach people to do is say, when he walks through the door, say, uh, I'm glad you're home safe. Um, I really love you, but it hurts me to see you like this. So I think I'm going to go up and finish my book. We'll talk tomorrow. So instead of engaging in a hassle or an argument or a fight, you just let it go and walk away and then go to your therapist and, and talk about it and, and look at other ways to approach him when he's sober to talk about the good things about your relationship and, and about the things that she misses, not, not being spending more time with that person. Yeah, okay. So. And, and just out of interest, how common would you say it was for – like a, a family member or relative to come to you to try and sort of fix um, the substance abuse user, if you like, and that actually working and that you getting that person in treatment as well and helping them. So it becomes like a, a family approach, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense because the, the more healthy the, 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 the non-drinker is, and if there's kids involved, then maybe she can help the kids be non-healthy and, and, and stop yelling and screaming and fighting in front of the children which isn't helping them understand, you know, grown-up relationships. So it is a family issue. And we also suggest to them um, if they would like to bring in another person, uh, a family member, a, a teenage son or a daughter or somebody else to help them 
talk a little bit about what's going on with the family, we do that as well. And, and it's, it's not against the rules to do that. Uh, it's just up to the, the particular person who enters treatment for her, for her child or her husband, who she might bring with her to support her and talk more about it when they're away from the office. We also give them homework. I mean, I've, I've got a couple of books that I've written, and one one book, I Get Your Love When Sober, is, is the, my best-selling book ever. I've got six books, and that's the one that sells the most. Most of it's in five different languages. And I've had people, with, there was a study done uh, at University of New Mexico as a dissertation with Dr. Bill Miller and myself, and the student, what she did is she uh, uh, randomly assigned uh, 40 uh, individuals that, who wanted to help someone into um, getting a, a group craft program, which we did it in groups, or just get they just gave them the book, Get Your Loved One Sober, and say, good luck, come back in three months, and we'll talk, then we'll come back in six months, but we want you to follow the book. And we were really astonished, basically, because the, the young students got in 71% of the 20 people that they worked with and the people who read the book, they got 40% of their loved ones in treatment just by reading the book. And that's higher than the Johnson Institute ever did. And that's higher than Al-Anon ever did in all of the studies that have been done. And there's about six or seven of them that I know of. There's one going on in Sweden now that we'll take a look at later. But everybody who's tried it, Luke, has been successful. Yeah, okay, so. yeah that's really interesting. So, yeah. with, so with your system... Um, how would you say like people find that? Well, therapists really like it because if you're a uh, work in addiction field, you know that you get a lot of resistance and kind of people angry that some of them don't want to really change. Um, but when you work with a family member who comes in, they're very motivated to help their family. Um, uh, women don't divorce their children. You know, women who are married want to stay with their husband if they're, if they're still with them and they're in love. They remember the good things and they try to forget the bad things. So when people come into treatment, to them it's a breath of fresh air because here's this therapist agreeing with them about, boy, it's been horrible and it's been a hard time. I can't understand everything you've been through. And I, I teach therapists when I do training to let them know that they're heroes. These people who come in to help somebody else to me are genuine heroes and they have a lot of courage. To, to face a therapist to try to help somebody else who's not even in the room, that, that's a whole different kind of therapy. But it's, it's everybody who's tried it, from South America to Africa to Sweden to you know, the Holland to the, the United Kingdom, the, I, the people in Australia that are using it right now, uh, the, 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 the people who come in love the therapy because it's all about them and helping them feel better. But in addition to that, we can teach them new strategies how to interact with the drinker or the drug user so we can get those people when the when the person says, why don't you come with me to, to my therapist? Just come one time and see what you think. And the key is when that person comes in that one time, you have to treat him with respect and dignity, no judgments, just be very upbeat, no pejorative in, uh, talk, and let them know that we're not here to give them a hard time or to, to, to criticize them. We're here to support them in whatever way they want to try to get their life back on track. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing how well it works no matter where I do it. And you don't have to be like a Ph.D., you know, or a, a medical doctor or something to do it. I mean, I have people around the world in Ireland and, and in America in several places where they use what they call recovery coaches and paraprofessionals to help run groups with craft for women who are excited to come in and talk about their lives. And then if a woman gets her husband in the treatment, she comes back to the group, everybody celebrates, and then she kind of motivates the other women to continue the program and to see what she can do to get her husband or her children in the treatment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and how would you say it differs, differs from like a person-centered approach? Well, I think in some, in some ways it's very much similar to, to, to that because what I, what I preach is client-focused therapy. And, and, and basically, we have happiness scales, and they, they have different categories, like, uh, uh, let's say, um, getting along with your children, let's say, your communication skills, let's say, your emotional life, on and on and on. And we say, why don't you choose one of these categories that you've looked at? They rate them on a 1 to 10 scale. And we look at the different ratings, and you can change the form into 
just putting depression down, you can put down domestic violence down, you can put something else down. That, and then you say, which one do you want to work on? And so we work on what the client tells us she wants to work on. I think it's arrogant in the addiction field that we see somebody for one or two hours and we think we know more about what they should do than they do. You know, you know what I'm saying? I met the person. How can I know what they really are like by two hours? So I better listen to them. Um, there's a great quote by the Dalai Lama, and I use it, and I tell people, basically, when you talk, you only hear something that you already know. But when you listen, you may learn something new. And so the key here is, is to listen to your clients and then try to help them shape their life around what they think is the best way to do it, not the way we think it should be done. Yeah, okay, that's really interesting. And how, if you had to give like a quick synopsis of like the craft uh, process, how would you say it goes? Well, uh, first of all, I give people, I tell them, you can use any protocol at any time you want. To, you, know, you don't have to do it in a certain order. So when you start meeting the person, the first thing you do is, is let them tell you what's going on. Let them cathart a little bit about all the horrible things that's gone on. And at some time, you have to steer them away from that stuff by saying, boy, all the information you've given me is really important for me to help you. Now let's figure out how we can change some of these problems. And so you can go right into to changing some problems. And the first thing we like to do is try to help them change their interaction and stop yelling, screaming, calling them names, being negative. And try to find some positive things to find out when they are sober. When they're not using, when they're not stoned, whatever it is, then it's time to say, well, it's so good to see you like this. It's so much fun when you're not using or whatever. You, you can even use a milder approach, and, and some people want to use a heavier approach. But the keys are is changing your interaction with the loved one that drinks or does drugs, and try to be more upbeat, and then try to take care of yourself. So you, then you're role modeling a little bit, not only to your husband, but your children, a positive approach. So one of the first things we teach people is positive communication skills. And the first one's like a show of empathy. I might say to somebody who comes and drunk, I might say, I understand that you like to be with your friends and you like to drink and everything, but you know, it really bothers me when you do that because I love you so much. Um, uh, I, I, I hope you can think about this and we can talk about it tomorrow. Um, and then uh, again, communication skills, letting them know we understand, uh, we can see that he's having a problem as opposed to uh, criticizing everything. Is there anything I can do to help? And sometimes we tell us, well, look, if your husband has anxiety problems or he's having trouble at work, tell him, look, I go to therapists for, for this problem. I can take you to the same place and they'll help you find a job. They'll help you deal with how to talk to your boss. They'll help you deal with other situations that you're not happy with right now. If people are drained into drugs because they're not pleased with their life in some category, Obviously, so when we can get them in, we can help them sort that out. And we do that again, like I say, there's no judgments, there's no yelling, there's no confrontation, there's no lecturing, there's talking to people. Like we're having a conversation right now, Luke. That's what we want to do. We want them to have a conversation and feel comfortable and relaxed and let the client know that it's going to take a little bit of time. And don't get upset if they still drink a little bit, you know? But the idea is if we can get them to cut down using a harm reduction approach, that's great. If we can do it quicker, that's fine too. But we've got to move at the pace of the client. Because here's the thing. I teach people to say to the client, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do on here. The bottom line is they don't do anything unless they want to do it anyway. So, but the idea is if you say that, it gets rid of a lot of their anxiety coming into treatment. Because they think as soon as they go to treatment, you're going to take away all their drugs, all their alcohol, you're going to call them names, you're going to judge them. We don't do any of that. And that's why we have we offer the, the, the loved ones, when the drinkers of drug, drug abuse come into craft, when they get into the program, what we do is we, we talk to them, we support them the best we can, and in and, and, and the, the therapy we use, we offer them 12 sessions in the clinical trials, and these guys came in nine out of 12 sessions, as they were, you know, and in alcohol treatment, coming nine out of 12 times for a person who's using alcohol and originally said, I'm not ever going to treatment, that, that's pretty darn good. Again, my research is about engagement, how you get somebody into treatment, and how you keep somebody into treatment. And the bottom line is you just got to be respectful, and you got to be supportive, and you got to let them move at the ability that they can move. Because it's like telling a 12-year-old, you know, when he, you know, in eighth grade, he gets an A in, you know, in math, and then you say, God, you're so good, I want you to take advanced calculus next year. Well, she's going to be able to do advanced calculus. 
Same thing with a drink. We've been drinking for 10 years. And you say, well, you can't. You have to stop right now and never touch it ever again. That scares the hell out of them, you know. And then they might not come back. So if you don't do those kind of techniques and you just be a little softer about it, you might be able to keep them around long enough so we figure out maybe I should try this, you know. Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds really interesting. It's almost like you help them like rebuild their life as well. So you don't just say your problem is alcohol. It's like a lot of the times the person has a lot of problems and they need to fix them so that they can stop depending so much on their crutch if that's alcohol or whatever substance that may be. So that I like the concept is really interesting. And like you say, that almost gives them enough freedom to stick around long enough so that maybe some change can actually occur. Um, but a question would be like how long do you think um, people take to change? Like you said, if someone's been drinking or using drugs for 10 years, saying stop now and never do it again is probably going to scare them off. <laughs> so Absolutely. How would you, so how, would you work, how long would you say is a good time to work with them until that sort of process, start they start to see change? Right. Well, I, I think it depends on the individual, but what we have found, and there's been other studies, uh, I'll give you a quick example. There was a study done in Canada to help people moderate their drinking. They didn't want to stop. They wanted to moderate their drinking. So when the study was done, Martha Sanchez, Craig did the study, and when the study was over, she found that half of the cohort of people who came in, half of the people who came in actually became totally abstinent by the end of the program. So what that shows me, and it shows other researchers as well, is that once you can get somebody in and you help them cut down a little bit here and a little bit there, maybe their life gets better and they're treated differently and physically they feel better in the morning when they wake up and they're not totally sick to their stomach and all those kinds of things. So all of a sudden they start thinking, hmm, you know, maybe I should cut back or maybe I should stop, you know. So the idea is that we can get them in and give them some ideas, give them some examples, and some guys stop very quickly. And the reasons they do is one of the studies that we did was we asked them open-ended questions. Why did you come into treatment? And most of them said, because I found out through my wife I was ruining the family life. I found out also that I'm really messed up and I need some help. But there wasn't a lot of negative con uh, ne negative statements. They didn't say, like, oh, because that woman made me. And uh, I, I can't believe my, mo my mother made me come in here or stuff like that. That was like, geez, I really realized I needed some help. I didn't realize my, my wife loved me so much. I, I didn't realize, you know, that my mother, you know, was, was so worried about me. All those kind of things were the comments when people came into treatment, which made us feel real good. There was some negative ones, but when we did the study, the, the positive ones were statistically different, higher level uh, than the negative comments, you know, when they came into treatment. And, and again, when we followed the, the, the clients in our studies, for the 12 months, at the end of the 12 months, 80% of those people were still uh, were, had cut down or were absent from the drug that they were using. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like really good results, and it sounds yeah. like you almost help the family members under help like help the substance abuse user sort of see the um, see the problem that they've caused. I think it's like if you have a frog and you put it in cold water and raise the temperature of the water, it won't jump out because it doesn't know that what's happening. So you almost yeah. use the family members to sort of let the frog know, if you like, that the temp what the temperature of the water is in order so that, you know, they can protect themselves and help the family and improve the environment. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good analogy. I mean, it, it, it does work that way because once they even cut back and think about it a little bit, they start looking at it differently. And then, of course, they look at their wife differently. And one of the, the, the reasons why people come in is, the husband, let's say if it's a husband and wife team, the wife can come in six sessions or five sessions, whatever, and she's changed her, uh, and he says, what the hell's going on with you? You act totally different. What are you doing? Are you having an affair or something? You know, so a lot of them think, you know, she must be nice to me, so she must be doing something, you know, <laughs> like that, like having an affair, because that's the alcohol mind, right? But when they stop and see that she's really doing all this to help him, and she says, well, the reason I'm, I'm changing is because I'm going to therapy to help the family. Not because you're a stupid drunk son of a bitch, you know, it's because, because you know, it's because I'm helping the family. And then he looks at her a different way. He says, well, where are you going? What are you doing? He says, why don't you come with me just one time, see what it's like. You don't have to. You don't have to say this. And, you know, the idea, again, when I train people, the, the key is that engagement piece, that, that no confrontation. Oh, hi, how are you? Uh, we love your wife. She's been working really hard. I wonder if you'd like to join us somehow and uh, work on some other issues, whatever you choose. You don't have to work on anything that I'm going to say. I want you to take work on what you want. And, you know, if people start cutting down on things that bother them and learn how to deal with positive, using positive communication skills 
and other skills that we teach them, problem solving and so on, to deal with stuff at work or maybe with the kids or the neighbors or whatever or the family. Maybe he gets to the point where he doesn't need, like you said, maybe that's the cause of drinking. And if you can get to the root by him telling us that, maybe we can uh, help him get to the point where he doesn't have to use it at all anymore. Yeah, okay, that's, yeah, it's all really interesting. I guess we are sort of coming towards the end now. Are there any other like final thoughts that you have or anything you'd like to include? Well, yeah. No, I mean, I, I just think that the, the craft program is such a great protocol, and I'm, and I'm not trying to brag or anything. I just stumbled onto it, you know, because of my family. Um, and it, it just seeing and I everywhere I go, Luke, it's the same thing. Where, where and actually in Sweden in particular, they mandate craft for all the people who work with the family. But everywhere you go I, in the world, somebody knows somebody who's got a person in the house who's using drugs or alcohol inappropriately, and that causes all kinds of problems. And the sooner we can get those people in the treatment, the more likely they are to stay sober and the likely, more likely they are to not ruin their lives physically and psychologically. So. Yeah, okay. and I guess I've got to ask the final question that a lot of us are asking. Where can we go uh, to find more about craft or to find someone who provides that service so we can get help for someone that we care about? Yeah, you can actually go on my website and there's a list of certified therapists and programs. And there are people in the UK, uh, especially in England, uh, some in Australia, uh, some in Canada that, that are on my website that have been uh, through the process. And they're actually trainers and they're supervisors of craft programs. And, or they can go to go to my website and they can click on the books. The one book that, that sold, I know it's sold in England. Um, it's, it's only about maybe 10 pounds, a little bit less than that. Uh, it's, it's $10 in America, so it's probably a little more in, in, um, in England because of the pound. But you got to start somewhere. And a lot of the women just start with the book and um, read that. But there are people available in, um, in the UK and England. And I think as time goes on, there'll be more and more people that get certified because the, the group uh, up in northern um, England, they're, they're training other people in craft across uh, across England. They're, they're a wonderful group. Um, it's called the PPP group, and um, it, it, they're on my website if, if people in England want to check it out. Yeah, okay, excellent. Well, I'll be sure to link to the website and your book in, in the show notes. Um, and thanks very yes. much for coming on the show. Oh, my pleasure, Luke. I'm sorry it took so long for us to get together, but I do appreciate your patience as well. Yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> Glad we could finally make it happen. Thanks very much, Robert. Have a good day. Yeah.